Well hello, every, well, hello everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Conversations with a Pro Trader. I'm your host, Greta Wall, and I'm joined today by Dan Darrow. Dan is a professional trader with T3 Trading Group and also a co moderator in the Alpha Team VTF with T3 Live. Thanks so much for joining us today, Dan. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Yeah. Uh, so uh, our first question, as always, is going to be the same. How would you grade your week of trading so far and why? Um, so I'd say it's about a, a, a solid B. Um, okay. Mainly, and we were speaking a little bit earlier about this, but mainly um, for me, it was actually a bit of a quieter week up until this point. Um, mm -hmm. A little surprising because I, I, I thought it would be a, a, a bit more eventful with what um, was on the calendar earnings wise. but um you know as as uh as I'm, I'm sure you know all of your guests have said over over like the past few weeks i mean you know you trade what you what the market gives and sometimes mm -hmm. it's super busy sometimes it's a little bit quieter and um for me this week has been a little bit quieter even though i, I had a uh, higher expectations coming into it so um there was there was some good trades some some less good trades and i'd say overall about a about a solid b for me this week Okay, um, before we get into our discussion about earnings and options and you know why they're one of mm -hmm. the best op things to use around earnings, let's uh, talk about your best trade of the week so far and your worst trade of the week so far and what made either of those good or bad. Yeah, so um, actually um, over this past weekend, there was a, a biotech conference um, that had um, a few names that were that, that I had been watching for data releases. Mm -hmm. um, so. I, I actually played um, a couple of those bios, um, just, you know, I mean, names people might not be super familiar with, but, um, it, you know, it actually ended up being some like good action, you know, one of those like calendar events that I, I really like to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, so there were a couple of names, um, ticker MRUS, the other one is R -A -Y. Uh, but just, you know, a couple of names that were data driven, um, you know, totally unrelated to like overall market action, just, you know, like news, you know, the, the data comes out, stocks go up, stocks go down, you know, just very specific to those, um, to those names. Mm -hmm. um, as far as like worst trades, I, I mean, Netflix today ended up being a, a losing trade for me and, and we'll, we'll get to that. I'm mm -hmm. sure in a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I ended up playing that and the options, well, the stock went the, the wrong way or it went down, my options lost some money. So I'd say as far as like, like worst trades, that'd probably be, probably be um, the worst trade so far this week. I'm sure there might be a couple more <laughs> looking at the price action on Tesla after hours and it could be another one. Yeah, we'll be talking about, about that one later as well. Yeah. Uh, for everyone who's joining us live, I just want to give you a reminder, this is a Q&A session, not just for me and Dan, but also for you and Dan. So please, in the live chat, submit your questions. And in the second half of this event, I'll ask Dan those questions for you to make sure we're talking about the things you want to learn about from Dan himself. Uh, just a little background on Dan. He is an options-focused trader, so he is an options specialist within the Alpha Team VTF, but he also has, as he mentioned, a lot of focus on biotech and he's a uh, kind of an expert in that field as well. Uh, so if you have any interest in learning about options or bios and how Dan plays them, please submit those questions and I will ask him them for you. He can't see them, but I can. Okay, so uh, my first question, I guess, is the big news of the week this week, as you mentioned, is earnings. And for many traders, including yourself, options are considered a good tool to use for news events like earnings. So explain why this strategy is so beneficial for for binary events like this. Yeah, so um, you know, one of the things I I, I feel like, um, and and uh, we've we've spoken about this for for a long time in, in the VTF, and what I really mm -hmm. try to like like express to traders is that um, earnings there's always going to be a degree of risk. I mean, I mean that you know nobody knows for certain. Um, what a stock is going to do. I mean, you know, you know, let alone something where, you know, the earnings, there's a lot of different variables that play into it. So, um, you know, some people just don't like playing earnings because of like that, that unknown risk. But when it comes to options, like the great thing about, uh, about like, the, about having the ability to like define your risk in the sense that, you know, you can always know at any given time exactly what your max potential loss would be. Right. So if, if you're mm -hmm. trading, if you're trading like debit based contracts, meaning if you know if you're long calls, long long spreads, long puts, et cetera, you know, not selling premium. If you're if you're long premium, then you'll know that you know at any given point, this is my max loss. So 
when it comes to these events, you know, you have like maybe like a, an educated opinion or, or, you know, you have conviction that it's going to do something. Okay. Mm -hmm. Options, you can risk a, a, you know, X amount of money. And at the end of the day, it doesn't work. Then your max potential loss is going to be X amount of money safe versus like, if you were to, to buy stock or short stock into earnings trade doesn't work. I mean, you know, you don't technically know what it what you're going to lose so mm -hmm. um that that whole element of defined risk is just to me it, it it always like is has been well suited to trading events i mean just being able to to you know control the amount of money you put into a trade could you know know at any given point this is my max potential loss i mean sometimes you know your your, your potential gain could be could be you know undefined as well if it starts to work but you know in other situations you kind of like cap it but i always felt that that options are particularly suited to this type of trading, um, you know, you still need to like really analyze setups and, and kind of have like a, a bit of like a, a, you know, info on the, like the background of the company, because you're not, you don't want to just like throw random money at, you know, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, kind of like coin flip trades. But if, if you have, you know, good setup, informed opinion, and you can define your risk, then, then to me, it, it seems like, you know, really interesting scenarios for, for a trade opportunity. Great. All right. So now let's talk about specific earnings that we've gotten in so far. Uh, we've so far, we've gotten results from all the big banks at this point. And for them, things are looking, you know, pretty good. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, record revenue at JP Morgan Chase, a, a beat from most of the big banks on profits. Some, you know, saw a little bit of a miss on revenue. There was there was some extra focus on these results coming into this week after the regional banking crisis that we saw in early March. What do you think these earnings from the big banks show about the banking system overall? Well, I, I mean, admittedly, I, I had the big banks haven't been as big of a focus for me um, to, to trade earnings wise, but I mean, I know how important they've been to the action in general mm -hmm. over like the last few sessions and you know especially for a lot of people's focus just since march um so you know having like read about it it just it seemed like like people just wanted a sense of stability mm -hmm. right um i mean I, I think people in the aftermath of the banking um crisis in march you know a lot of people assumed that that the big banks were going to be the beneficiaries because money was going to like come out of like the more at risk regionals go into like the bigger safer banks mm -hmm. um and i, I think to to you know a certain degree that's that's what like earnings like over the last few sessions have have really confirmed is that the big banks seem to have really come out of this you know a bit ahead we've seen like a lot of like those deposit flows um and then and that's that's good and i think the commentary um out of like the ceos has has been you know really positive as well saying yeah. you know I, I think today i was just reading i believe like the morgan stanley ceo said like there is no there is no you know credit crisis there is no credit right. crunch so mm -hmm. you know like having like this really positive commentary plus you know putting in putting up numbers that you know kind of give people confidence that okay maybe you know maybe it was like just like a few bad bad apples mm -hmm. maybe we can get past this right so I, I i think i think overall even though like the action on some of those big banks maybe wasn't particularly you know it, it wasn't like you know a huge gangbusters moves although jp morgan did I just think it was, mm -hmm. you know, encouraging, positive commentary, and and really that's what people are looking for and and, and hoping for, honestly. Yeah. So the other big earning stories this week were Netflix after the close on Tuesday, which you mentioned earlier, that came in mixed, yeah. and then Tesla yeah. after the close today, a miss on revenue there for Tesla as well. Let's start off with Netflix. Give me your reaction to those results and how you approach those earnings as an options trader. Yeah. So I don't, uh, if you want to pull up the chart too, while we, we go through it, they yep. can, they can see. Um, so I, Netflix, Netflix was um, very lackluster. And I, I, I think, I think there was enough in the report for like both sides to kind of, you know, make like an argument, right. There were, there was a little, little for, for bulls to hang their hat on a little for bears to hang their hat on. But I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, it was very lackluster. Um, the quarter itself, um, just mixed, you know, um, and I, I think, I, I think what people were looking for was, you know, some sort of like sign that maybe they can get, get growth going again, or, or, um, seeing like, like, you know, some sort of, um, improvement in like the ad tier rollout. Um, so for growth, 
really no sign of there yet, sign of that yet, but like there is some improvement in the ad tier rollout. Also, it seemed like cash flow was a bit of an improvement. And they talked about um, you know, the password password sharing crackdown um in the months ahead or the quarters ahead. So I feel like the quarter itself just it wasn't very inspiring. And and that's part of the reason why like the stock slipped today. Um and you know, I, I think also though, like the commentary about, you know, kind of reiterating guidance for the year and 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 making progress towards the back end of the year, it's gonna keep like the stock probably in play, although you know, it just wasn't enough to really drive material upside. And and you know, if you look at the the chart here, I mean, you can see going back to the middle of last year, like July of last year, it's still kind of in this like long uptrend. And I mean, this is the type of quarter where I, I feel like it just it just keeps the the like the trend intact. It, it wasn't enough to really drive it materially higher. It also wasn't bad enough to really set up like a material breakdown. So I feel like it's one of those quarters where it's just you know it was okay, nothing special. The trend remains intact, and and I, I would probably look to approach the stock, you know, from that perspective moving forward until something else changes. Um, for me, going in, I was thinking, um, okay, coming off like a pretty solid quarter. Um, in uh, January, if they did manage to, you know, surprise and turn in something positive that it could move through like the top of, of, of the recent resistance, but it just didn't materialize. I mean, that, you know, that's, that's what we were talking about before, you know, it's defined risk. I was looking for a pot potential uh, breakout and, and a move back up towards that February level. It, did, it didn't happen. So at the end of the day, like the, the money I lose is, you know, what I was, was planning on, or, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I didn't want to lose the money, but you know, my, my, my risk was premium paid. And, and, you know, now at least I have a bit of like a, a game plan of how I want to approach it moving forward, which is, you know, wait to see if it gets back to the, to the uptrend support, and then maybe look at something a few weeks out, a couple months out, something like longer term. Okay. A uh, reminder for everyone who's joining us live uh, to submit your questions in the comments. We will get to those in the second half of this event, whether it be uh, you want more about something Dan's talking about with me, you have a totally unrelated question to our conversation here, anything and everything, at least, you know, related to trading, uh, Dan will talk to you about during this event. So the, I have the same question for Tesla, Dan, your reaction and how you approach that release throughout today's session. But it is important, I think, to note the automaker did cut prices for the sixth time this mm -hmm. year, earlier today before reporting earnings. And we did get a sales miss when they reported Q, Q1 mm -hmm. sales ahead of these earnings. So, yeah. So why don't, why don't we pull up the chart? Let's pull up the yeah. chart of that as well. Yep. So we can walk that. through that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I actually, so, so Tesla for me is actually um, a, a position that I initiated last week. Um, so part of my thinking, you know, it's funny, actually, I, I, um, when we last spoke about a month ago, it was, we, 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 uh, we um, went through Tesla and it was the lead mm -hmm. up to the delivery number. And, and now it was the, you know, it just so happens that today was the earnings date. But um, what, what interested me about Tesla last week is that um, it showed a little bit of, of weakness um, ahead of ahead of this week. And, and I, you know, I figured with like a, a stock like Tesla that, you know, historically gets a lot of interest around these major events that um, the stock um, approaching like the bottom of this this um, this little uptrend that had formed, it, it seemed like an interesting spot to to go long, you know, either play for a bounce this week or play for some of that enthusiasm to kick in and see option prices pick up. Um, so the position I, I entered was uh, were call spreads, um, and I got into them last week looking for a possible uh, move and retest of the um, late March high. This week, it just you know it just hasn't really done much. And then today, when like you said, when they announced the uh, you know further round of price cuts, it just really deflated the stock. So um, what I decided to do was just sell further out of the money premium, just kind of like cut back my risk. I didn't want to add more options because I, I thought the setup was changing a little bit after all these like you know like another round of price cuts. I, I also didn't think that the stock was going to have like a ton of downside, which you know, we'll see if I you know, end up being right about that because I'm, I'm noticing that it's trading lower in the after hours right now, post earnings. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, it, you know, coming into or going into tomorrow, like, like it's really going to just be like, okay, you know, the, the, the numbers were a bit disappointing. They look like they missed on margins. I was just reading about it before we, we hopped on the call here. Um, so they, you know, they, they missed on the margins. We'll see what the stock does on the on the earnings conference call and, and see where it opens tomorrow. But, but I mean, for, for Tesla, it's just, 
can it can it hold this upper range, right? So it you know it had a, a really nice move in January, a big reversal, a really strong run at the beginning of February, and now that it's it's come back from this this really nasty sell off at the end of 2022, it's just like okay, yeah, this this quarter may not have been great. There was a little bit you know a little bit of like weakness in in certain pockets, which you know people may have been expecting when they keep announcing the price cuts. And and then you know for the for this stock it's all driven about it's driven by like sentiment and momentum so it really mm -hmm. just needs to like hold these higher levels and and not start to like you know lose like the 170s low 160s because that that's really going to probably turn people away from it so I mean I don't know if there's going to be a, a a really fantastic setup on it tomorrow but I do think like if it can hold around 170 hold above some of the moving average support that it could really keep it at, you know, in play for the foreseeable future. All right. I'm seeing those questions roll in from everyone. So please keep submitting those. I promise we will get to every single question. I will ask Dan all of them. I will not skip one. So anything you want to know from him, continue to submit those questions in the chat. So as you and I were talking about ahead of this event, Dan, earnings will kind of pick up steam next week. Next week is kind of the big the first big week of this Q1 earnings season. We have big tech names on the calendar, Microsoft, Alphabet, Meta, Amazon, they're all reporting, plus some other key players as well. Talk about your expectations for next week and then this earnings season also as a whole. Okay, so let's um let's start with the chart of the of the queues here. Um, okay. And then we'll we'll go to just a couple of individual names. Yep. Um, so what I what I think is kind of interesting um, as it as it sets up currently, and we'll see how the week finishes, is that um, we, we've been in a, a very tight consolidation on the queues um, for about like the past two two weeks at this point. Now, um, I, I would say you know ordinarily like a consolidation like this once we once we get a breakout you know should have like a, a decent sized move right so after a consolidation you look for an expansion of the range um i think what's what's even more interesting about it at this point is that you know as the calendar lines up next week as you said is is probably the biggest week of earnings season mm -hmm. um for for this quarter i mean you have microsoft Meta, Amazon, and Google all reporting next week, which are, are all substantial weights in the queues. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, if, if if we do end up staying range bound into next week, we're, we're going to have the queues going into, you know, the last week of April, the biggest week of earnings and, and a week where you're going to see, um, you know, four of the five largest weights in the in the index report. It just seems like a, a fantastic setup for, for either like a breakout or a breakdown. I mean, just like a range resolution. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I think, you know, in addition to the names you mentioned, which we'll talk about in a second, I think the queues themselves are, are actually a, a, an interesting setup just because, I mean, the, the, the consolidation has, has, you know, gotten to a point where, I mean, we're going to have major catalysts pretty much every single day next week. And, and, and any of those on their own could, could deliver a break of this. So I, right. I think, you know, and, and I mean, the, the pricing will change, but I was looking at the, the cost of the straddle for, for next Friday expiration, which is um, April 28th, mm -hmm. and it was pricing in about 775 and, you know, to me, like, you know, that, that could end up being something where, you know, it's a little bit underpriced, especially if we do manage to break the range, because we, we should see a pretty sizable move once we, you know, either go up or go down. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk through some of those yeah, specific exactly. tracks we have yeah. for those so, coming up? Yeah, so let's, let's pull up uh, Microsoft first. Okay. So um, kind of an interesting name, um, and I, I know there's going to be a lot of focus on it just because it's been mm -hmm. a top performing stock for the last, um, well, basically all the year. But I mean, just since the middle of March, it's, it's really had just such a powerful move. Um, now, if you look back over like the last um, over the last year, it's actually bumping up into a, a pretty big resistance range in the, in the low 290s. Um, so I, I think like a, a name like Microsoft, which has had like a, a really strong run. I mean, I, I think this is going to have to be like a clean print um, where, you know, they think the expectations have gotten higher as the stock has run. Analysts have raised their targets, right, to keep up with the move. So a stock that's bumping up into, I mean, I mean, literally like resistance for a year. I mean, I think it's going to have to be like a, a, a strong, clean print. And, and actually, that wasn't the case last quarter. I mean, it was it was a bit more mixed. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think Microsoft has had a, has a great recent run. But I also think that, you know, for, for next week to really get like another powerful move higher, it's going to have to be like a, a very solid report because, um, you know, it has had 
you know, a large move and a, and a big area of resistance. And it does seem like one where if it's not perfect, there could be a bit of retracement versus, so Amazon, if we mm -hmm. want to pull that up, yep, try that. Amazon's a little bit different to me. Um, so Amazon has, has obviously lagged. It's been one of the names that, that, I mean, it, it's up off it's up off the recent low, but it's still really not you know participating to the same extent as some of the other uh, some of the other mega caps. But yeah. to me, it's 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 kind of like an interesting scenario for that reason. It's where you know where Meta or or Microsoft or even Apple, you know, analysts have been kind of like chasing chasing the movement and keep raising their targets and maybe raising the bar a bit. Amazon has, has been a little bit different in, in that it hasn't had like the same love. The stock hasn't been moving as much. So to me, it seems like the bar could be a bit lower. And when you couple that with the fact that the stock is actually at kind of like an interesting technical spot, you can see it's like push, uh, pushing up into to several month resistance after um, rising rising support throughout um, 2023 it seems like it could be a, a you know kind of like an interesting setup especially if, if the numbers are are decent um, and then if you look back even further the the yellow line that i have on those charts there is the 200 day and and that's that's been like a long-term level of resistance and it's sitting mm -hmm. just you know just very very close above so um to me amazon's a, a, a I mean, of like the four mega caps reporting next week, Amazon's uh, probably the most interesting setup to me. Um, and, you know, we can check updated pricing once we get into next week to see what, what the options are expecting. But it does seem like one of those 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 scenarios where um, the options could be mispriced a bit, um, especially if, you know, surprisingly good or surprisingly uh, bad report. Yeah. So you've mentioned options pricing a couple of times here. And even for mm -hmm. equity traders who may not trade options, the options market is used as a barometer of implied moves for a stock um, before mm -hmm. and after an, a news event like earnings. So uh, talk about how the options market gives equity traders insight into what a stock might do. Yeah. So, um, so uh, that, like, like you said, I mean, not not everybody trades options, but it is useful to to mm -hmm. to you know know what options are expecting because it does give you an idea of what the implied move is. So mm -hmm. you'll you'll hear often that that people will say they'll reference like the implied move for a stock for mm -hmm. for earnings or or for a week or for you know when we, if we have like a CPI, they'll say the implied move for the the SPY is is such and such, um, and and basically what they're saying is like the option market is anticipating a, a move of of such and such percentage or such and such like points and and that um most people just trade like there's the most people just take the the, the shortest dated at the money call and at the money put add it together and that's the that's the expected move and mm -hmm. what you know what's nice about that is is that it just gives you an idea of of the expected volatility so mm -hmm. um you know for like a name going into earnings you know, maybe it's something you were, so like, say, say, for instance, it's, you know, you, you don't trade options, but you're sitting in like a stock that is going to have earnings like tomorrow or the day after, right? And you're just wondering like, okay, what's the expected risk on this? Like, you know, mm -hmm. is the stock, are people expecting like a 5% move or are people expecting a 15% move? So, right. um, you know, the option market, even if you don't, you know, you don't actively trade options, it's nice as like a reference because it gives you an idea of, of what, what the, the expected move, you know, from, you know, a, a large portion of people is not, not just like what, what you think it's going to say, or what, what you, what you think it's going to do. This is like what, what the overall market is anticipating. So yeah. just gives you an idea of, of that type of movement. Cool. Okay. Um, so I'm uh, still seeing those questions come in from everyone. Continue to submit them. I have a couple of questions left here and then we'll get into those audience questions. Uh, so Dan is, can be talking about what you guys want to learn about as well. So continue to submit those questions. If you hear anything he says you want to know more about, or you have something totally unrelated related to T3 trading group or options trading in general, et cetera. Okay, Dan, so looming over everyone's head is the next Fed meeting. We're two weeks away as of today from the May 3rd rate decision. And the Fed futures market is showing, you know, a, the large majority of traders betting on a 25 basis point hike. So what are you focused on as we head into that meeting over the next two weeks? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. Uh, the, the, Fed, the Fed funds futures have been, it's it's been very dynamic over the last yeah. um, several weeks. Uh, and, yeah. you know, I, I'm sure even like through next week, it could be changing too. So um, before we, but before we began speaking this afternoon, um, I checked and, and right now um, the May, 
the May um, the May Fed funds futures are saying there's a about an 83 about an 83 percent chance of a 25 basis point hike mm -hmm. um so you know that that's been like quietly like or, or slowly shifting higher um mm -hmm. I, I think what'll be interesting is is just um you know as we get into the beginning of may and, and the fed meeting um is just like what the fed what, what the fed governors say and then right after that we're going to have some some data um, so we're gonna have the jobs report and then we're yeah. gonna have the cpi on the 10th of, of may and then that mm -hmm. that's probably really going to impact expectations for um the middle of the year because yeah, i mean it just we we've had we've had at, at you know different points just um like i mean people were expecting uh, uh I, I think at one point people were expecting a, a two two rate cuts this year um, yeah. I, I think at one point in March, like the, the December December Fed funds futures were pricing in a full percentage point, which would be mm -hmm. uh, uh, four, four cuts. Yeah, so um, you know those have kept moving higher, and and now right, I mean as it stands, um, there's only one cut priced in in December, but you know that that's that that to me is what's most interesting as we get to the Fed is that like you know in the aftermath of the of the march of the march banking crisis i mean people were expecting some people were expecting a, a rate cut coming in, in in the middle of the summer in july yeah. but you know now that keeps getting pushed back pushed back but pushed back december went from four to two and now to one so you know I, if people keep getting like the feel that the like the fed is going to have to keep rates higher for longer if we're really moving past the 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 you know like the the bank crisis how does that way on sentiment in tech because you know tech has really benefited from this idea that the fed is close to pausing or, or even mm -hmm. like pulling off the gas so you know if the fed reiterates that you know we still have more work to do and then in the beginning of may right after we, we have you know some some economic data that maybe is still a bit hot right like what does that do for fed funds futures and you know like alternatively how does that impact how does that impact tech, which has had such a like a phenomenal run over like the last yeah. few weeks? So th there's there's a lot of moving pieces. I mean, I, I think the Fed meeting is going to be interesting, you know, both both for for what they do and also like their commentary. And, and I think like the, like the following week right after it is going to be just as interesting just, you know, for like those those big economic um, um, data points. So speaking of economic data points, the UK this morning released or overnight really, but really early this morning for the US released their inflation data and that came in hotter than expected. And so that prompted concerns about, you know, sticky inflation, inflation not going down globally, which then of course does impact the US as well. And that, you know, caused a pop in treasury yields, which drove futures down for the US stock market. Yeah. How I think some traders might forget that, you know, what happens in the rest of the world still also impacts what happens here in the U.S. So even as we're getting our inflation pressures down in the U.S., still hot, but down, mm. how much does the global picture start to also impact how people are feeling about whether we're in a lower but sticky inflation picture versus a continually lower to the 2% goal? Yeah, it it's funny because you, you, like you said, you, you don't you don't hear about it. I mean, right, right mm. now, I feel like everybody has blinders on. With just like the U.S. situation, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the U.S. It's just it's like so so like so focused on just getting the U.S. inflation, U.S. inflation down. But mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. It, it's 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 not just the U.S. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's it's many other countries are, are experiencing like the same issues. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's part of the reason why why people think like inflation is 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 just so 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 sticky or or, or may my may end up being so sticky is because mm -hmm. it, you know there's a lot of a lot of moving pieces to it um and and even though like you know certain areas you might see it start to pull back there's still a lot of areas that 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 aren't pulling back and i mean if you have like other countries which are having like similar issues i mean it just it creates like this this like like global almost like like higher higher bar of inflation and it and it's just it's tough to unwind that and i mean you know m myself included i mean I, I feel like we just are, are so focused on what's going on in the u.s that that you know we just don't we don't pay attention to what's going on in the rest of the world but mm -hmm. you know if inflation does start to moderate a bit in the u.s then then like you said i mean like there's still other things that we need to be concerned about that that are, are going to make it tricky to really see rates start to like come down quick or, or at least as quick as some people are expecting. Yeah. 
In an interview over the weekend, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said the fallout from that banking crisis in March may do some of the Fed's job for them. And this is a point that you made in our last live event together, that the tightening of credit conditions by banks is in itself disinflationary. Uh, so explain that for those who may not have been here before. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting because I, I, I feel like there's some of these big bank um some of these big bank executives have, have been trying to like walk that back um, yeah. over the, like the last few days. Except but, for yesterday, I forget which bank it is, but major layoffs in their auto loan department said they wouldn't yeah. um, finance anything over 110% loan to value and no yeah, over exactly. 50%. Yeah. So they're tightening in yeah. specific They're, they're tightening parts. in specific areas. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, so, so basically, I mean, like people, people assume that when the banks go through these crises that, um, like you know, banks are a little bit re more reluctant to like lend out many uh, uh, money, especially to like to like uh, you know endeavors or or you know companies that they believe to be at higher risk. So, mm -hmm. um, I, like you said, I think one was like autos, and then another one. Um, I think I forgot who mentioned it, but I was reading a press release, and they were saying that um, commercial real estate. Um, so you know they're tightening back their 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 lending in commercial real estate. Yeah. So I, I I think I think I think it it absolutely has had had an impact though it might not have had as as you know overarching of an impact as people may have first expected when you know they saw like you know Silicon Valley go down and then it was Signature Bank. So at the time it was you know people were worried about like major bank runs across all sorts of different regional banks. And you know the implications that may have had would be that you know these these banks that are are more for like you know local communities really like dial back the lending. How does that how does that impact those local communities like you know small businesses etc. Now that maybe we're starting to move a bit beyond that, you know it doesn't mean that we're out of the out of like the woods, right? So now. Mm -hmm like that that credit tightening is happening in certain pockets maybe like you said like like autos commercial real estate so um what that you know what what that does is just it just i feels like it it like eases eases off like the gas pedal or, or like you know some of these some of these areas that that needed the money are, are having a harder time getting it so it just it might slow things down um but you know, it, it may not have had like that that huge credit crunch that people were you know, maybe like fearing. To be honest, at 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 the you know beginning of the bank crisis in in March, it was just that you know people thought that everything was going to dry up, and then all of a sudden, you know, people couldn't get the money or the loans, and and like the spending would dry up, like the investments would dry up. But it does seem like like that may not be the case, but it is a bit of like a tightening in certain pockets, like 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 you said. Yeah. Okay, so I do want to get to our audience questions. Everyone who is joining live, please submit uh, more questions if you have them as we go, and we will answer every single one of them. Uh, first, a comment from Derek, your fellow T3 trader. He said, nice shirt, Dan. So compliment yeah, from Derek. Okay. He likes your shirt. Um, our first question comes from Gillis, and he asked if you use options and scalp trade. Yeah, so, um, so scalp trade, I mean, like, do I scalp options or scalp equities and options? Uh, I mean, I can answer both. Yeah, so I, I, I do, I do focus, I, I do focus uh, much more so on options. So mm -hmm. um, I, I both, I scalp options, I, I swing trade options. I also trade events with options. So mm -hmm. um, I do a little bit of everything. Um, for me, scalping options, um, it, it typically revolves a, a little bit more uh, around like intraday or, or like, like news based stuff during the session. So, I mean, there, there's times when I, you know, I'm literally in like an option uh, an option trade for for seconds so mm -hmm. you know if i if i get into something it moves quickly I'll, I'll sell it i mean like i don't have a defined holding period when it comes to it like some some contracts are seconds some are minutes some are days some are some are weeks and months mm -hmm. um so yeah i i definitely do do scalp options pretty frequently um you know it's not every day but i mean it also depends on on what's going on during the during that session okay our next question comes from Yan France. First, he said, "Good to see you." You, he said, "We used to trade at the same trading desk yeah. back in 2007." Uh, yeah. So, uh, a, a trader you've known from the past is is here. Yeah. What, um, he, what's his up, yeah. question, <laughs> his question was, "What do you use most, credit or debit options?" Also, what do you look for on a weekly basis, not earnings releases or a news-driven event regarding choosing your trades or tickers? Um, I usually mostly mostly debit um okay. mostly debit based strategies um you know credit when when i feel like they're appropriate um and as far as like 
as, as far as strategies outside of events, I mean, it, it's, it's a little bit of like, um, it's, a, it's a little bit of like a blend, say, of maybe momentum and, and technical. So, um, you know, just momentum in, in the sense that, you know, you want to be involved with the stuff that's moving. So, you know, if something's moving and I'm, I'm looking at, you know, continuation patterns and, 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 you know, focusing on like option setups that, that I can kind of apply to that, uh, or, you know, break out. It's like the, the standard technical, like, like setups as well. Right. And so mm -hmm. if I think a stock is about to break out instead of like, you know, purchasing equity in it, I, I would look at to, to like buy calls. Right. So it's just like, you know, looking at like consolidations, resolutions of the consolidation and breakout, breakdown, you know, things like that. Like, whereas, you know, some people would just would go with the equity, you can, you know, approach it from the same way. It's just, you know, you know, buy, buying calls or, or buying puts and like trading the breakout from like a, a, a similar manner. Okay, uh, we have a few more audience questions. So for everyone watching, again, just submit any more you have. I'm happy to ask Dan questions that I have personally, but I wanna make sure we're talking about what you guys wanna learn about. So submit those questions in the live chat now. Jose asked a question more focused on T3 trading and your role within T3. He asked if you provide options training or, and or mentorship for new traders who are joining T3 trading. Um, so we provide, T3 does provide um, different trading training services. Mm -hmm. um, my my mentorship role more revolves around being in the in the um, in the alpha team room. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in the alpha team room, um, you know, we we interact with with a lot of different traders, and um, you know, some some have um, a ton of experience, some have very little experience. Um, so the like the, the mentoring, the mentoring um, kind of is more. It it it, it takes place on on a more um, like you know daily intraday intraday level where people can ask questions whether that's like you know what i'm looking at trading wise what, what what am i what am i looking at like option wise what am i looking at you know down the road or or just even like mentality or or just like basic option 101 um so you know for me like that that's like done of the mentorship role i'm in at this point um but as far as like training education um t3 does offer offer those services um so if you want to you can go check that out you know mm -hmm. I, can, yeah. I can plug t3 here <laughs> yeah great okay so uh i'll ask you a question uh our big economic data next week is focused on the housing market and then on first quarter gdp we'll get our first estimate of gdp next thursday i think but you know all the other news is kind of on the housing market the housing market has been this weird sticky part of the whole inflation picture prices are not necessarily going down they're just kind of not going up anymore they're just kind of leveled off because demand mm -hmm. is still high but supply is still low because no one wants to sell their house because rates are so high and no one wants to buy a house because rates are so high and it's this really messed up picture and so on the housing market how do you think that impacts the economy overall whether we go into a recession a deeper recession or a lighter recession based on what you know the, the problems we're seeing in the housing market they're they're not going away for the fed at this point yeah that's, i mean it's an interesting question um and i don't i don't know if there's like a correct answer for that um mm -hmm. I, I mean for for me it's something that hits hard you know it hits it hits close to home like no pun intended yeah. because uh, my wife and i have been have been you know looking at the housing market like you know trying to like find something to to buy and mm -hmm. I mean, you you live in California with with uh, myself. I mean, you you, yeah. know, you realize like the state of the housing market out here is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. We sold um, and bought last year. It was not a good time to be a buyer. It was a good time to be a seller. Yeah, no, there you so go. We're That's, we're in the nice. whole hope for a refinance next year. <laughs> yeah. Situation. Yeah. So it it's it's really it's a t it's a tough spot because um, I I think I think like you said, people are reluctant. People are, are married to their rates at this point. They're not married to their homes. Mm -hmm. um, and people are very reluctant to to give up their like two or or three percent um, fixed rate right now, and uh, I mean I think I think what the Fed is, I I think what the, like, the only thing the Fed can really do would be to, to like keep rates higher for a longer period where you know maybe we don't get a a, a immediate correction of real estate but like over you know a slightly more extended period. Mm -hmm. maybe like those those prices plateau or, or even start to like come down because i mean you know life of life events happen and like people right. people get married people have a family people's people lose their job or they, they change careers and they, and they move so 
you know, people, I mean, not, not everybody has to move, but there are a lot of people that, that, that do end up moving. And, you know, even if like the prices don't, don't correct in, in a, in a, in a, you know, dramatic fast fashion, I mean, over like, you know, a couple of years, maybe like the prices just don't go up. Right. Or maybe, they, maybe they start to like, like slowly, slowly, like, like, you know, pull in a little bit and, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, outside of creating like a massive recession where everybody loses their jobs and all of a sudden nobody can pay their mortgage. I mean, I don't know what, what, what the fed, the fed could do at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's just, it, and, and, and you know, I, I've, I've read so much about it and, you know, some people are convinced that the housing market is in a bubble and, and we're due for correction. And there's other people that say like, you know, there's still, there's still buyers that are, are looking to get in if the prices did correct. So there, there's going to be, right. you know, like kind of like a, 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 like a perennial, like, like, you know, bid underneath the, the housing market. So it's just, it's not an easy, I don't know if there's an easy solution to it. And and I think it's also like, kind of like, like hyper local as well. I mean, yeah, depending on, on, on where you live, it seems like, you know, different, different locations are experiencing different things. I mean, like, you know, the Pacific Northwest, San Francisco, you know, some of like the boom towns during the pandemic, Austin or, or even like Phoenix, mm -hmm. they seem to be going through a more, uh, you know, a steeper correction versus, you know, like some other areas that didn't see like the same dramatic rise. I mean, I mean, I, I've, I was seeing that in, in Florida. I mean, some prices are up year over year. So, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, I wish there was an easy solution. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, I, I would love nothing more for like the real estate in Los Angeles to correct. 20 or 30 percent but mm -hmm. i'm not seeing it um and I, I don't know for for you seeing it i don't know if you're seeing it either um but there's a house just, to sale down the street and it's a uh, still higher per square foot than i paid for my house last year so isn't it wow yeah 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 it, it's it's wild it, it really is so uh, mm -hmm. but yeah it's it's something that it's something that 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 definitely uh um, you know, hit, hits close to home for me. So I'm always reading about the real estate market. I'm, you know, I'm very, very <laughs> interested in it right now. Me too. Personally, I'm also very interested in it. Always have been. Okay. Our Gillis asked, and this goes with what I was going to ask you as well. He asked about your thoughts on a possible recession. And for me to add to that, we're going to get that Q1 GDP number next week. Everyone is expecting growth in this quarter and then, you know, that negative growth to come later this year. When do you see the U.S. possibly hitting a recession this year? <laughs> do you agree with everyone else that it's going to be Q3? You know, I, I, yeah, it, it, it's hard for me to like really like like go against consensus just because it seems, you know, it, it seems like like that's the way things are lining up. Um, but I, I also... I don't know. I, I, I mean, it seems like a, a recession, uh, uh, like there's, there's going to be possible different levels, right? Like it could be mm -hmm. just a, a very mild. Um, it could be a little bit more moderate. I mean, you know, there's still so many like unknowns and variables that, you know, even if we, even if there's like a very high chance of us having a recession later this year, I mean, you know, whether it's like mild or moderate or even like, you know, worse than that which hopefully it's not uh -huh. it, it just it's just so it's so hard it's so hard to see in the distance like that i mean i you know i listen to like different economists and, and different like market commentators you know everybody's kind of saying a little bit of like a something something different but um i mean it, it does seem like we're, we're heading that way i just i think people are kind of just disagreeing over like like the magnitude of of what's coming and and yeah. I, I mean you know i mean i don't think people just, you know, I mean, just a, just a month ago, we had like a banking crisis and, and I don't think anybody saw that happening. Nope. So it's like, it's like things kind of like come out of the blue sometimes and, and just create, you know, so much more uncertainty that it's hard to like really have like a firm grasp of like what's going to happen six months from now, because I mean, we don't even know what's going to happen like, like six weeks or six days from now. It's kind of, yeah. at least like that, that's, that's how I look at it. And, and that, that's kind of how I, I've, I've approached it where, you know, I, I like to, I like to know people's opinions. I like to know what, what, like, you know, the smart, you know, like the, the smart economists and, and the smart market commentators are saying, but, you know, I also take a lot of it with a grain of salt, because if you go back and, and read what they were saying in, in, you know, 2021 and then 2022, it's like, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people got it wrong. I mean, you know, a lot of the things that happened were hard to predict and, you know, the, the overall, 
what what took place overall was like far off of what they were expecting and and i mean who's to say like that that couldn't potentially happen again this year where you know everybody's thinking this is you know such like a certainty but at the end of the day i mean you know all the variables that we don't know they they could have like a totally different impact on on what yeah. the outcome is an interesting earning story for me was united airlines yesterday after the close they had you, they're expecting to turn a profit next quarter and expecting revenue growth here over here as they enter, you know, that summer season of travel. Yeah, I, I bet with, they are. Have you have you looked at the price of flights recently? Yeah, yeah. With the backdrop, though, of everyone expecting us to go into a recession. So if you're expecting mm -hmm. recession, you expect consumers to pull back on spending. But then the airlines are saying, well, everyone's going to still travel because the mm -hmm. world is, you know, reopened. How, mm -hmm. how, I don't know, how do those jive with each other they don't they don't yeah <laughs> they, they they don't jive i mean yeah. at some point and and i i think that that's I, I think that's one of like the major things too is that people are looking at it's like like you know like like discretionary spending or or the, these you know people's like vacation i mean at what point do they start to to say like you know enough is enough i mean i mean what you know flights the flight prices have been high like the hotel rooms yeah. have been high like these experiences you know like going to like concerts, Taylor Swift, like going to like games, right? Yeah. I mean, everything is just so much more expensive, but, but, but there's, there's been, you know, like there's, there's been demand still. And, mm -hmm. and I, and, and I, I think, I think everybody's kind of wondering the same thing. Like, when do we get to the point where, where, you know, like you, you hit like the, you hit, you hit that level where it just, where like it, it, like demand just can't go past like this, like it can't support these, these prices. And, I don't know if it's going to ever cause a recession for, for like the airlines to, you know, to like, for like the pricing to come down or, or for like mm -hmm. the demand for to air travel to come down. But I mean, it seems like, I think that's, that's one of the things that surprised people up until this point is just like how there's, there's still been like such incredible demand for, for, for travel and, and for a lot of like these experiences. And um, I mean, I suppose as long as people, um, you know, prioritize it over, over certain things, right? I mean, I, I don't know what they're giving up to be able to afford these experiences unless they're, you know, just, you know, they're, they have like a lot of discretionary income. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it just seems like that's like the path we're or on. burning through that, you know, high yeah, savings. the pandemic savings, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, yeah. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I was just looking at, at, at air, at air travel. And I mean, it seems like flights that were maybe like $200, like, like a year or two ago are now like four to 500 and, yep. and, yeah. And, you know, even, even, even then, I mean, you know, flights are, flights are full. I mean, maybe the, maybe like the, yes. the capacity is down, but I mean, it's like flights, flights are full, like, and, and people are paying. So, yeah. I mean, I guess the airlines have no incentive to, to, to lower prices if, if no. people are paying. Like they're still technically paying higher fuel prices than they were at this time last year, but they're paying way lower fuel prices than they were at like that peak, that peak mm. level, but they still as a customer say, you know, oh, fuel prices are high. Yeah. Uh, another story that kind of was, was quiet today was the release of the Fed's latest beige book. The beige book is, you know, a survey of all the Fed districts and how the economy is faring within those districts. The beige book said they did see or shows they did see a decline in loans following the Silicon Valley Bank collapse. And that is adding to stress in the economy. Inflation is slowing not as much as they want. Hiring, though, is starting to slow, which is good for the inflation picture, not good for this, the health of the economy. We've been in this circle of bad news is good news for the market until I feel like the last jobs report, that, that shift kind of happened in the last jobs report, where maybe bad news is bad news again, because mm -hmm. traders are looking at the possibility of a recession in the third mm -hmm. quarter. As those recession fears ramp up, how do you expect the market reaction, the equity market reaction to unfold? You know, it's, 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 it's tough. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, cause I, I think, I think one of like the main drivers, so I, you know, at, at, at the risk of, at the risk of like upsetting, like all these other, you know, people that trade all these like thousands of other stocks, I mean, it seems like on on, it seems like right now there's like ten stocks that 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 really just matter more than everything else combined, and I, I, you know, 
and, and those are like the, obviously like the big the big tech names and a couple one-off names like elsewhere and it seems it seems as though people have come to the conclusion that 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 these names are either recession proof or they're defensive mm -hmm. um and they feel like they can weather whatever storm is coming better than than others mm -hmm. um and what's interesting about that is 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 that they make up so much of the weighting of of several of the, the indices that right it, you know like people 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 might start thinking okay like bad news bad news is bad and and you know the recession fears might be might be heightening but somehow you know like the those those handful or two handfuls of stocks that that carry all of like the like the cloud for the indices they keep getting like these inflows so it it's like it, it to me it's like it's like something like in like the sentiment has to like change on around those names for for like like people's fears around a recession to to really escalate because if people say oh you know so it's recession fine like I'll, I'll just you know you know buy apple they have so much cash on the balance sheet or or you know like buy amazon people are still gonna like do like they're spending or buy meta i mean like you know people are still on instagram and people still market with with them right so mm -hmm. it just it to me it's like it's like you know recession fears on one hand um, but then people's sentiment around these other stocks on the other, and and mm -hmm. it's like it's kind of like a battle between the two, where um, you know people's people's opinions on those stocks need to change for like bad news to to really really have like that bad news impact because right now it just seems like people people feel like those are are you know safety in in, in like in this storm right now and and they're keeping the indices afloat, which kind of gives people like this sense that. You know, maybe the recession's not going to be so bad, or maybe things aren't as bad as they are. But I mean, it's really just like these handful of stocks, or two, or two handfuls of stocks, which are are giving like this false sense of security to to, yeah. to me. Like like that's kind of my opinion on it. Okay, we have another audience question, and this is going to be my last call for questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, submit them, and we will answer them as we wrap up here. Joseph asked, in your year-to-date trading, are you in the green or red so far this year? And what is your what are your most common best trades? Okay, so I I don't I don't ever talk numbers, so I okay. talk trades. Like that's how that's how it, it's always. So people that are on a VTF know that. Yeah. Um, so um, year-to-date trades. Um, I'd say, I mean, one of like the best ones would be, um, just off the top of my head, uh, VKTX. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a little bio, um, and that was one of the ones that we, we had been talking about on the VTF or the alpha team room, excuse me, for, um, uh, for an extended period. And, um, it's just, you know, it was like a data-driven biotech play. Um, and what we were looking for was just, you know, Phase one proof of concept data came out. Stock had a, a you know it was great data. Stock had a phenomenal move, um, but the, you know like that was one of those names to me that um, uh, I had been looking for. Had had a, a little bit more size in it than I do like a, a normal trading stock. Um, ended up working out, um, and I mean it's continuing to go. Unfortunately, I'm not in it, um, but you know it's one of those stocks where it's you know ha had like a, a game plan. Had a you know a thesis on it, ended up working out. Um, did have a little bit more size on it too, which helped. And and you know for me that that was one of the names that like moved the needle a bit more um, in 2023. Okay, uh, so just to wrap things up here, uh, you at this point in your career, as you've talked about, are an options specialist. That's where you focus most of your trading. How did you come to focus on options? Why did you pick this as your favorite way to trade? Um. You know, it it kind of it kind of moved that direction um, because I I found I found earlier um, in my career that I, I really liked I, I really liked trading events um, mm -hmm. and one of the, like the problems with with that just being like an equities focused trader is just that um, you know there's just there's too much risk associated with that and I you know I, I feel like I would miss like some of those those larger overnight gaps and to me it was frustrating and you know i i i felt like getting to options you know allowed me to participate on those you know more along the lines of what i wanted to do mm -hmm. um also 
um, when I when I you know when I first started trading, I, I was exclusively like equities focused, and my my style was always very very like short term, like like scalp oriented. Um, so um, I, I would hold positions like you know very either like very quickly, so like several seconds, minutes, um, very very like short term, like just in and out in and out in and out style and then you know what what happened was like i'd look back over like you know like the day or like a week and i'd say you know i was so like hyper focused on on like these these like micro moves that i I missed maybe larger macro moves so um what i ended up doing was like kind of like uh, like marrying the strategy where i i you know i'd still do like the like the hyper scalping but then i'd also Mm -hmm. have some option positions which allowed me to like swing and, and maybe like capitalize on like those 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 longer larger moves okay so for everyone who has joined us live thanks so much for joining this edition of conversations with a pro trader what a great discussion dan i learned a lot and you answered a lot of my questions so that was great for me and for everyone who watched i hope you enjoyed i will be back next week with t3's senior trader derek olden smith he is the leader of the ProDesk virtual trading floor and again dan is a co-moderator in the alpha team virtual trading floor with t3 live so again thanks dan so much for joining me today for everyone who is still here i am one second putting a link in the chat for our next live event again that will be next week at 5 p.m. Eastern with Derek Oldensmith. And so hope to see you all there. And Dan will be back in about a month in mid-May. So we'll check in with you again then. Sounds great. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.